Yeah, okay, so, so Max, is, uh, Max is unfortunately not with us today, so I will take the introduction duties. <laughs> um, so welcome to another meeting of the conservation side of the CEFIS-S seminar for this year. Uh, and we have the distinct honor and privilege to have Professor uh, Benedict Marceau Vincent with us, um, who has worked on all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, it would take him too long to even describe. Uh, history of chemistry, history of environmental science, uh, most notable as, as the kind of, I think, precursors to this, to this work. Um, but now doing cool stuff on, uh, on conservation and biodiversity as well, so we're really pleased um, to have her here to talk on soils as ecosystem services. So, please. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, shall I speak English or French? What do you, what do you like? Uh, Eng English, is, English is better, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, for the first time in, the, in this uh, building, uh, which is kind of utopian building. And uh, what I'm going to present is, in fact, the, um, the result of uh, a research that we conducted, I say we, because I'm a member of, and I'm the, the vice president of the Ethics Committee of INRAE, uh, so INRAE, uh, which is the Agricultural Research Agency <coughs> in France, uh, IFREMER, uh, which is for the marine uh, and uh, fishery, CIRAD, which is for development, agricultural, uh, agriculture and development, and IRD, which is for Institute of uh, Research and Development. And we, in this uh, ethics committee, we were uh, working on how can we really adjust the two missions, main missions of all these committees, which are to uh, secure uh, the uh, agricultural resources for these countries and at the same time to preserve the, the environment, the landscape. This is the dual, the double mission of all these uh, national agencies and of course there are sometimes conflicts between the requirements of feeding an increasing population and uh, it, that means producing more and more crops and uh, preserving the environment. And we decided to work on two specific aspects of the, uh, this huge problem on waters. And we have been working for one year, <coughs> one year and a half on the distribution and, uh, of water and uh, a fair distribution of water and use of waters, and uh, on soils. So I've been in charge of the soil uh, opinion. And why did we specifically uh, focus on soil? Because they are key actors, of course, for agriculture, and uh, for food production, for increasing human population. And soil are, if I can say, the, the ground or the, uh, for any agriculture. <coughs> and they have to be preserved for agricultural reasons. But they are also living environments. <coughs> and they are home to a wide variety of organisms that perform a number of ecological uh, functions, including uh, storing CO2 for uh, climate change, regulating climate change. So how to articulate these two aspects? That was the, the question that we uh, have been trying to address. And for this, we were relying on all, uh, all the alerts that have been uh, launched over the past 10 years about soil, soil deteriora deterioration. And uh, there are many, many uh, um, agencies now that are really um, introducing and raising the issue of soil. Even the IPCC, which in the beginning didn't take into account the question of soil, have now they have introduced it because it's 
it's part of the climate regulation, as I mentioned, but also our behavior with the soil will be extremely important for the future uh, climate. And the alerts are uh, driven, motivated by two major uh, problems. There is a huge uh, soil retrogression, what we call retrogression, because of the uh, movement of urbanization. Artificialization of soil is a major, major issue, especially in the 20th century with the increasing movement all over the world from the movement of the population from the country to towns and especially bigger and bigger towns there is an increasing artificialization of soil not only in Europe but in many many southern countries where there is absolutely no regulation for that and it's a major uh, source of soil deterioration. Another a uh, major issue, as you may know of already, is soil degradation. Why? Because, uh, because of industrial um, uh, industrialization. There is a lot of uh, pollution, many, many soil have been polluted by the extraction uh, industries, uh, especially around the mines, and as you may know, this kind of uh, extraction remains uh, the population with heavy metals, especially, and uh, remains uh, for a long time. There is also the problem of pollution with um, nuclear uh, radionuclides due to either uh, extraction of uh, uranium in some countries, uh, especially in Africa, and uh, and uh, with the, all the dirt. so its pollution is really a major major issue for for soil, and there is also erosion, of course, because um, the use of uh, in agriculture, the use of uh, <coughs> more and more. Um, Mechanic uh, equipments, mechanical equipments, and the which didn't preserve the uh, surface of the soil. So f f when I take, I should have said that from the beginning. Soil means the thirty centimeters. It's very, it's very, it's not heavy. You know? It's a, it's a, a film, I would say. <laughs> Uh, if you remember, the, it's, but it's really a mediating zone. Uh, 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 soil is very, very important because it's <coughs> 30 centimeters and it means that be, be, below that you have the minerals, the rocks, the cellular, but this 30 centimeters or 50 centimeters have to be extremely uh, rich and that's the problem. And it's also very important because it's the interface between the atmosphere and between the air and uh, the, 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 the ground. And for this reason, it's also the medium through which water filters and circulates. And it plays a, uh, an important role for the regulation of waters. So many, many uh, aspects of water, air, and I would say fire, also the four elements are present here. And um, so the degradation of soil is really now a big issue that the uh, United Nations uh, uh, have taken on board uh, recently. The global view is really uh, alarming. Uh, 40, 24 billion tons of fertile soil are lost every year, mainly because of urbanization, and there is an acceleration of that. And 33% uh, of all soil degradation is due to agriculture or pollution. So it means to human agency. I mean uh, either agriculture or pollution. So uh, soil is could also, in certain, you know, it couldn't be a marker of the Anthropocene because it's not 
lasting for uh, uh, the marker for the Anthropocene has to last for many many centuries, and soil are changing all the time. But it's a mark of the Anthropocene of the action of humans on the on the planet Earth, and they are really the victim of. Uh, uh, the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution, the green revolution of the 20th century. So what I'm going to uh, present, it's a very short overview, uh, uh, a hi historical glimpse just to show the, how our view of soil has been changing over the past 50 years. And uh, it's really important to see that the, 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 our view of soil is changing, but our action of soil on soil has a, uh, a durable impact. So there is, a, a, in my view, this is part of the problem. There is, a, there is a, a, a contrast between our changing view of this milieu and I, I say a milieu, uh, and the, 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 the long-term impact of our action on this milieu, which <coughs> will last long after uh, we can try to remedy to the disasters. And uh, then I will present uh, the, how this change have uh, affected our way of managing soils, from soil quality to soil health, today the catchword is health and soil health. What does it mean, soil health? And then from soil health to a more recent concept, which is now extremely successful and has been taken up by all stakeholders, and which is uh, 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 Ecosystem, ecosystem service, soil as ecosystem service. So I will discuss these two concepts, <coughs> health and ecosystem service. So from a historical perspective, you may remember, whatever uh, age you are, that uh, soil was mainly uh, a place to grow food and that what I call the chemical paradigm has been really inaugurated uh, in, the, in the 19th century. I, I would even say, because I'm a historian of chemistry, as you know, uh, by Lavoisier, Lavoisier who was uh, also <coughs> an agronom uh, and a chemist and a fermier général as well, and who was very good uh, in accounting and in his uh, domain, agricultural domain, in the Loire Valley, uh, at Fréchine, he managed his farm like, uh, like, uh, like uh, he managed his experiment in his lab. I mean, balancing the input and the output. You know? And this became really the paradigm for 19th century agronomy, which developed ac according to uh, the chemical paradigm, uh, which has been really stated and clearly stated by Justus von Liebig, uh, who enjoyed an, a, a tremendous success all over Europe, and he att attracted students from all over Europe. And his idea in his book, Chimie appliquée à la physiologie végétale, and agriculture is really that you have to balance the inputs and the output and some kilo de he used to say some kilo de blé means some kilo de fumier uh, uh, hundred kilo of crop you have to balance it with a hundred kilo of manure and uh, what you you, you have to balance. It's accounting chemistry. And uh, the reason, the, the way to, uh, to achieve this program has been, of course, the substitution of um, organic fertilizer, guano, may, was the main one, as you may remember, 
the substitution of fertil uh, organic fertilizer by synthetic fer fertilizers. And this was made possible by uh, the Haber-Bosch uh, process, which allowed the production of uh, nitrogen, which is one of the major uh, fertilizer. And that was the great uh, era of the NK NPK, NPK, NKP, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which was the uh, the, the miracle world, the miracle cure, to increase, tremendously increase, the productivity of soil and. Uh, the productivity of soil are effectively be uh, multiplied by 10 and uh, uh, over the uh, since the in the 1950s and 1960s. But <coughs> meanwhile, there has been a number of disasters. You uh, may know uh, the disaster of the Dust Bowl, especially in the Midwest, uh, which interfered with the Great Depression in the 1930s. And that was the result of the application of this agriculture, which was both mechanical and chemical, mechanical with uh, deep uh, plowing, uh, with tractors, and uh, which uh, really provoked wind erosion and uh, the dust bowl has been something that has really marked the, uh, the, the history of agriculture. And it uh, doesn't mean that in the 1930s uh, no one was interested in the microbiology of soil. There were research at that time. And there were people who alerted, but they, they were not listened. And uh, the microbiological paradigm has really not, uh, re, uh, be, been resurrected, I would say, reactivated uh, recently because of the, uh, the disasters of, uh, or the scandals, I would say of uh, the chemical companies uh, like Montesanto, uh, who really uh, uh, used to uh, spread and overuse pesticides and fertilizers. And uh, <coughs> in the 1970s, when there was the, the famous Silent Spring uh, alert by Rachel Carson, and the emergence of the environmental movement, uh, the, uh, some people started to investigate alternatives to uh, DDT, which was the main problem at the time, and uh, to investigate also uh, alternative fertilizers. And there were also alerts about the problems of uh, the, uh, the, the biodiversity of soil. Because the, uh, the, the soils are really host for a uh, home for many, many microbes. Uh, there are, here they say four, in fact, there are much more, <coughs> but all classifications, as you know, are faulty. And uh, there are, uh, in fact, five uh, soil microbes, types of soil microbes, bacteria are by far the, the bigger population of the soil. And there are something like 10 billion of bacterial cells per gram of, so of, of, of a normal soil, a living soil, I would say. And uh, of course, these bacteria are extremely important for the direct uh, fix fix fixation of nitrogen which is extremely uh, important. And uh, there are fungi. Fungi, uh, fungi <coughs> are everywhere, uh, especially they are close to the roots of plants, uh, to the roots of uh, uh, any, any plants. Uh, no roots co could uh, spread without symbiosis with fungi. 
and uh, they are extremely important. And in between the bacteria and fungi, there is uh, an intermediate species of micro, uh, mi microbes, which are the actinomycetes. Uh, and they are extremely important because they produce antibiotics for the plants. Because <coughs> plants have their own natural antibiotics. And they are produced by this uh, plant. There are algae, of course, and protozoa, uh, all kinds of protozoa. And uh, in, uh, in addition to microorganisms, there are many, many, it's a multi-scale niche, I would say. A multi-scale niche because there are all sorts of living organisms in soils, uh, microflora, uh, and uh, in particular, there are many, many uh, uh, diatoms. Diatoms, you know, this uh, extremely, like fossils, which are extremely important. There are minerals in between me. And uh, microfauna, and uh, mesofauna also, and the macrofauna, which is uh, mainly made of worms and uh, they all are the, what we call the engineers and the workers of soil. You know. They work, con they are continuously reconstructing soil and they really uh, create soil as a living milieu, a living uh, environment <coughs> which has its own dynamics. And the, uh, the expression, the phrase, soil's health, became fashionable in the 1990s, especially when the, uh, the uh, microbial, uh, ma ma uh, microbial uh, paradigm became uh, pre prevailed and became predominant. What is the definitions of soil's health is it's the continuous capacity to function as a vital living ecosystem. So it's interesting to see that soil is defined as ecosystem, okay? And at the same time, we'll see in a moment <coughs> that it's defined as ecosystem service. So we will have to, uh, to see uh, uh, the tensions between all that. And the, uh, the, the health of soil is uh, something which depends on a number of parameters. Uh, of course, <coughs> climate, which is uh, especially the erosion, uh, which depends on the internal uh, biodiversity of the soil, the, uh, that, but it depends also of the regime of water, and uh, it depends also on the physical support, on the geological uh, support. And uh, because soils are now uh, viewed as a living ecosystem, <coughs> they are also uh, uh, something that has to be conserved, that has to be protected. They are endangered, and we have seen that they are endangered. And uh, the idea that we have to preserve soil is now the basis of a huge program uh, uh, supported by United Nations and the World um, FAO, what is Food uh, Administration, what is FAO? Um, yeah. Food and Agricultural <coughs> Organization. Uh, and they have defined the, uh, the principles of soil health. The first one is to minimize our impact on soil, but of course we cannot dispense with soil, <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, but how to minimize our uh, disturbance of soil, to maximize biodiversity, to maximize soil cover, I mean to avoid to have a soil without cover because they are 
open to climate erosion and to maximize roots, meaning to continuously have a, a plant cover on the soil, which means, of course, to avoid artificialization of soil. And uh, from protection, uh, in addition to protection, there is also the idea that we have to remediate to the disaster that have been caused to soil. And a remediation became regeneration uh, when we assume that the biological paradigm for soil. So remediation implies uh, mainly uh, re reducing pesticides and uh, herbicides, all chemical uh, supplies for agriculture, depolluting, and uh, there are huge programs uh, for depollution of soils, especially in Belgium. <coughs> Belgium has been really key for the launching of de uh, depollution programs, uh, and uh, there are a number of techniques, uh, physical techniques like washing, simply washing, or thermal techniques, and also chemical techniques like using uh, surfactant to uh, assemble things. And uh, there is also uh, decontamination, which is another uh, uh, business, you know. Uh, decontamination, uh, from uh, the landfills, and many soils have been completely contaminated because they have been used as landfills, especially uh, in the uh, around the big urban centers and uh, uh, around industrial places. There, are, uh, we have to decontaminate heavy metals uh, around gas power station. Uh, and uh, also now, uh, there is also decontamination of radioactivity, for re radioactivity. And <coughs> this decontamination are extremely costly and very, uh, they take a lot of time. <coughs> and uh, and uh, now there are many attempts to use, uh, to use microbes to try to decontaminate and to re-engineer bacteria for purpose of decontamination of soils. So a synthetic biology is a key in this one. And of course, the major, major uh, measure for remediation is reforestation and afforestation. And uh, forest is really, and remains today, the, uh, the major remedy, natural remedy, to, uh, to, uh, for soil re regeneration. The problem, as you may know, is that every year there is a decrease, not in Europe, but all over the world, there is a decrease of forest. You want to question, I just wonder what does it mean, afforestation? Creating forest where there were no forest Oh, right, right. Introducing forest. <coughs> and all these programs are driven by, and this is where uh, now I'm really focusing on more epistemic and ethical aspects. And what we have been trying to do in our perspective uh, is really uh, to show that the uh, ethical problems raised by soil is not, cannot be separated from epistemic issues. And, uh, and for this reason, we pointed out that the prevailing approach to soil today is a functional approach. And uh, what I call in my <coughs> jargon as a philosopher of science, a techno-scientific approach. Uh, meaning that by functional uh, or techno-scientific approach, I mean that when you study nature, uh, you are less interested in what it is. You don't ask question, what is it? What is, 
a bacteria or what is a molecule. You are interested or how does it work? Or what does it do? What does it perform? And what can I do with it? Okay, you see the, the chain of questions. So th for me, this is really the, the, the dominant paradigm of a techno science. And this is the prevailing approach today in, um, in uh, agriculture and in all the, uh, the, the study of soil today. So this functional approach has consisted in uh, defining soil's health as the preservation of soil's functions. And they have identified four major uh, functions of soil, water storage and filtration, carbon capture and storage, and biological uh, biodiversity, of course, and food or productive capacity. Uh, what can we, uh, soil as support for agriculture. Okay, so we realize that, is that enough? <coughs> you can, you, you realize that this functional approach is limited <coughs> only to technological aspects. And we realize that there are many, many, many more functions made by, performed by soil today. Of course, it's a reservoir of, of biodiversity. Of course, it's regulation of water cycles. But not only of uh, floods and drought, but also it affects water quality. Because the quality of water for, uh, you know, of course, that now we drink better water in town than in, in the country because of the agricultural pollution of water, uh, of, uh, I don't know the word in English, the nap phreatic, the... Ground water. Okay. <laughs> you understand, of, of the, the underground soil uh, uh, by, by the, the pesticides. <coughs> and uh, So there are many other aspects, and uh, climate regulation, uh, but also soil are key because they, they they assume they, they perform mi the mineralization of soil. And the bacteria are key for the mineralization of soil. And uh, they are also, uh, uh, they can also be used for uh, making renewable energy. You know that in many, many places now you have solar for, uh, farms, which are uh, on, on the soil. Uh, in the, uh, oh, you also know that we, we can use agriculture for making biofuels. So it's also a source of energy. And they can also be a source of materials. Uh, many, many uh, housings are built with, uh, with soil. With, uh, in the in, in, in country, the pisé. I don't know the term in, in English, uh, but the, the traditional uh, housing uh, architectural uh, materials uh, are made of soil, which is treated with, uh, with uh, water. They are also, of course, uh, key for infrastructure supports, and that's the key of the problem of urbanization. And in addition, soil has many, many uh, cultural functions. And uh, uh, soil is, uh, first, is, uh, it has uh, an archaeological function. Soil is the memory of civilization. Okay? And what are we going to do with that? Yeah. We have to preserve the memory of centuries, millennia of human civilization. And also, we know that soil has a symbolic <coughs> value. Soil has a symbolic value as the, 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 the epitome of a nation, le droit du sol, uh, in some countries. And also, soil in many, many uh, civilizations 
is something linked to the dead people and because this is where we all end fin finally and so the there is uh, there are many many symbolic values so if we want to if we are now to move from the notion of soil as ecosystem or as a living milieu to the notion that is now prevailing in agriculture and everywhere in the management <coughs> of soils, the idea that soils are ecos uh, ecosystem service, we will have to take care of all these functions, different services of soil. And this is the problem. So uh, what, you may be familiar already. Are you familiar already with the notion of ecosystem service? No. So it's it's the it's a big deal. No? Uh, and uh, I was really surprised, and I discovered thanks to this uh, opinion that we had to prepare for uh, the ethics committee. I realized that I should have made a, a, a Google. Uh, a Google Gram. Uh, oh, okay. the, uh, now the ecosystem service. You see that it's been uh, it's the key word in the, uh, over the past uh, last two decades. It's amazing, you know. And uh, why is it so successful? Now, the definition for an ecosystem service is any positive benefit that wildlife or ecosystems provide to people. The benefits can be direct or indirect, small or large. And this is the official definition that has been approved and which uh, made it respectable, I would say. It was the definition adopted at the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2001, and, uh, which was an international assessment uh, in the uh, uh, called by uh, United Nations. And uh, this definition is interesting because you note that it's a <coughs> kind of boundary notion. It's a boundary object at the interface between science and uh, policy. Uh, and uh, the people who are using and relying on this notion of soil as ecosystem today, there are many, many stakeholders. <coughs> it's first, and it was uh, coined by uh, institu uh, international institutions, like this uh, Millennium Assessment, Biodiversity, United Nations, which are something like ins uh, international governance, I would say. It's all now used by scientists and uh, engineers, agronom, agronom engineers. It's used by decision makers at, the, at all level, local, municipal, national, and international. It's used by farmers, even farmers are using this term. And they, for, they, when they fight at the Salon de l'Agriculture, recently in Paris, you could see ecosystem service everywhere. It's, it's even uh, interesting. Uh, it's also uh, used by environmental NGOs. It's used by investment investors and by land users and managers. So why is it so successful? And isn't that maybe it's too successful? It was in the beginning. It was a simple metaphor. You know, metaphor where that was used uh, for really alerting people, including farmers, about the uh, ecological dam damage of traditional agriculture and of the, uh, the model of uh, intensive agriculture. And uh, this simple metaphor has been turned into something quite different into a real analytical tool for and research tool. And uh, uh, this scientific concept, it's now a scientific concept. And the scientific concept <coughs> is used for 
quantification and metrics of soil. And there is now an intensive uh, research effort on soils, which is conducted both at the national and the European level. And they are all relying on this notion of ecosystem service, and they have at, uh, uh, they are based on this uh, classification of the service, uh, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting. So they have really integrated the idea of cultural service also, and uh, they are trying to make everything commensurable. They are trying to make everything compatible, uh, how do you say, comparable and commensurable. It's a kind, you know, the uh, ecosystem service approach with things as diverse as biodiversity, which is the number uh, of worms that you have in one gram of soil, number of worms and bacteria and uh, the cultural benefit of soil and the, uh, the storage of CO2. How, how are you going to make all this commensurable? How are you going to make all this comparable? You, know? you need a matrix. This is what I call universal, universal scalability. Universal scalability is, is key you know, to handle all pro uh, ecological problems today. And we are trying to uh, address all ecological issues today through this idea that we have to quantify, we have to measure, and we have to balance benefits, costs and benefits. But we have to, uh, to balance cost and benefits between things that are absolutely incommensurable. And that's the problem of this uh, ecosystem service uh, concept. And um, <coughs> we uh, have, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> We, um, uh, we have identified three different kinds of actors who use this term, this uh, phrase, eco uh, soil as ecosystem service. There are first the scientists, ecologists, and agroecologists uh, of INRAE and uh, other agencies. There are uh, also the people in charge of economic valuation of soils and there are also the people in charge of soil governance which are uh, uh, municipalities, decision makers, uh, uh, infrastructures, uh, people who have to, uh, I don't know the term uh, in this country for the management of the territory management du territoire, uh, they have the special uh, terminology in all country. So what uh, <coughs> I, uh, we have tried to do is to question the underlying views, norms and values in, this, uh, in all these actors in the use of ecosystem service. So in the agroecological perspective, the purpose is and the use and it's extremely uh, helpful the notion of ecosystem uh, service is extremely um, fruitful to uh, understand and quantify the soil dynamics and they use all kinds of methods for that they use of course chemical methods of the chemical analysis of soils they use also physical analysis of soils uh, through um, infiltration rates, density, the, the texture, and uh, the porosity of soil, and uh, the compaction. So they have all kinds of physics study, chemical study, 
biophysical studies and also a biological, ecological uh, study of uh, the, uh, the biodiversity. And the main concern in this population, I would say, in the, uh, among these actors, is to preserve the biodiversity <coughs> of soil. The main concern is to evaluate and to uh, really. And uh, they really <coughs> developed, they made epistemic choice, which are, and I, I, will, I will argue, which are also ethical choice, uh, choices. And uh, especially they have a huge program in France uh, of mapping uh, the French soils. It's a huge uh, program conducted by INRAE and soil mapping uh, meaning, means that they, um, they, they developed a quantitative approach of, uh, to try to quantify how many micro, uh, how many organisms are in, uh, in soils, in, in, in grams of soil, all over the, terri the French territory. And um, they do that by pre uh, 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 collecting samples, and then they do high throughput uh, se uh, genome sequencing. And they have, uh, so it's easy, it's an easy technique and uh, it can be done. Uh, they also uh, realize that it's, n it's not enough to quantify the, um, to quantify the, the to, uh, to have access to the quantity of microorganism, of organism. You also need to uh, look at the, uh, their relation. So it's not only the density of, uh, of microorganism, but it's also the network of organisms. How they, uh, they make, and they call that the bacteria Facebook. I mean, they realize that the more connected the microorganisms are, the, uh, the best is the quality, the, 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 the the healthier is the soil. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, connected in what kind of ways do you mean? Pardon? What kind of connections do you mean? Uh, it's through parasitism, symbiosis, and all kinds of synergies between microorganisms. In uh, any organism. You know that the main synergy today is between roots, plant roots, and fungi. But in, the, in, in between the two, you have bacteria who play also a key role. So it's when all these species of microbes work together, when there is a real synergy, that it works well and it's healthy. So how can you, how do they evaluate that? So it, this is more complicated. They really have to do soil biochemical analysis to understand the, the dynamics of this soil. So this is uh, an approach, a very interesting approach, developed thanks to the notion of ecosystem service, and um, one aspect of ecosystem. Another uh, <coughs> is um, another kind of um, use of ecosystem service is the restoration dynamics, because it's not enough to know uh, the quantity of life in a soil and how these, uh, the various forms of life interact, you also have to understand the dynamics, the temporal <coughs> dynamics of this life. Because they have realized doing soil coring of, uh, of, soil, of damaged soil for restoring purpose, they have realized that the dynamic of soil is a major issue. It's a major issue because you have to adjust the dynamics of all the various life, lives which coexist in a soil. Uh, for instance, for worms to recolonize uh, soil, 
you need uh, at least one year. But for microbes to recolonize, you need three years. And the life of worms also depends on that of microbes. So how are you going to synchronize everything? You know, it's a major, major issue. And uh, so it's one aspect where the notion of um, uh, ecosystem service has been really beneficial. But if you look and at the same time, if uh, we try to ask them, well, but why do you so much praise biodiversity? And the answer was not always uh, the same, you know. And uh, for them, it's biodiversity because biodiversity is the means for something. For others, is uh, no because it's biodiversity. Okay. Uh, for some of the, it's, I don't know, it's worms. There are the people, you know, the world, the worm scientists, they are crazy about worms. <laughs> <laughs> and they will sacrifice everything for worms. <laughs> they are really passionate. And, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and because of that, they have tried to develop multi, multi criteria tools uh, to really connect all. The, uh, the aspects of biodiversity. And uh, here again, uh, so you can have a look at the biofunctal tool. Uh, it's uh, open access, I see, and it's interesting to, to see how they. And, uh, but the value of biodiversity remains, in my view, relative to the type of fun functionality they have to test. So it's not really <coughs> consensual. Now, if we look at the people in charge of the economic valuation of soils, uh, people in charge of economic valuation of soils, there are many engineers and um, uh, <coughs> scientists in charge of agriculture and territories and things like that. And what they have in mind, they want to evaluate the cost and benefits of soil health. And they evaluate the cost of lost biodiversity, for instance. Uh, they have established that there is a 30% decrease of crops, uh, a 30, pardon, a 30% decrease of biodiversity will uh, generate 50% loss of uh, uh, food pro uh, crop productivity. And they are also in charge of evaluating the cost of soil restoration. So they are extremely important to them. And they, don't, uh, they are not driven by the same values. Whereas the uh, scientists uh, in charge of evaluating the uh, bi uh, biodiversity were really uh, driven by what I call ecocentric values. Ecocentric values, uh, they were really concerned by uh, biodiversity and ecosystem uh, di uh, health. Whereas uh, in this case, they are driven by anthropocentric norms and values. It's more a uh, utilitarian approach of nature, and I mean uh, that the its soils are good for something. And nevertheless, in this case, they really they are concerned by the inherent value, intrinsic value of soil per uh, hectare and per year. So it's not it's half ecocentric and half anthropocentric, I would say. But it's mainly the notion of service for human purpose, and especially for uh, uh, in a utilitarian approach. And this has raised very interesting <coughs> half epistemic, half ethical questions. Uh, 
in, in, uh, in, for instance, which service is the most valuable? Is it provisioning, regulating, cultural? Which one? And uh, if you have to establish a cost-benefit analysis, you have to evaluate that. You have to make a hierarchy to prioritize this service. And uh, are there service for whom? And they are not the same for the providers of uh, ecosystem service, like farmers, and for the users of ecosystem service. Let's, uh, for instance, if you are uh, uh, living in a town, you are uh, uh, you enjoy uh, the country for uh, recreation, and you don't. We, we are not, not expecting the same ecosystem value, uh, value service as the farmer or as, uh, as someone else. <coughs> and on which scale? And the major question is: Is it for short term or long term? You have to evaluate the ecosystem service. Uh, it's difficult. Of course, soil, for instance, if I have to evaluate the uh, CO2 storage by soil, which is important. OK. First, I have to ask, do I evaluate, estimate uh, the, the CO2 storage or organic? carbon storage, which is not the same. And sometimes it can be conflictual, antagonist. Second, uh, if I have to evaluate this, is it, it will not be the same the first year if I plant a forest, okay, uh, and where there was nothing b before, of course I will have a benefit, a benefit. But the second year and the third year, Will it be the same level? So I have to evaluate over time, and that makes a problem. The third kind of people is the decision makers, the people in charge of policy, soil policy. And they have to take legal measures of conservation. They have to uh, find financial incentives, find uh, regulations, for instance, for CO2, uh, storage or reforestation, you have to pay the farmers to, to encourage them to do that. Of course, you have to apply remuneration or compensation mechanism, like uh, if I plant a forest here, that will compensate the pollution that I made in Brussels, and I will plant a forest in, uh, in Flanders somewhere, and uh, that's okay. Okay. So how are you going to, to do it? This is the kind of thing they, they are doing. Uh, so they are in charge of this kind of uh, compromises. And here again, we are faced with epistemic choice. <coughs> Today, <coughs> the unit of measurement is money. It's a market-based economy and it's a market-based uh, ecosystem service uh, notion. It's based on the, on the, on the, the unit uh, of the uh, CO2 equivalent, okay? And uh, it's a kind, kind, it's analogous to the carbon trading, at least. And uh, it means that we are really uh, in charge of this kind of neoliberal system and the ecosystem service uh, has really been extremely successful <coughs> because we are in a market economy <coughs> and uh, this raises a number of problems because it encourages good and harmful measures in particular you can use this market value as to encourage people to uh, do uh, agroecology, of course, but at the same time, the uh, anti-green farmers, and there are, there are some, you know, there are some hard-thinking 
uh, farmers who say, well, if you want me to stop because I'm losing productivity, if I'm not using fertilizers or uh, herbicides, then you have to pay me. Okay? And if you don't pay me, uh, I will destroy, continue to destroy my soil. Okay? So it works both sides. You know? <coughs> and uh, so it, the, from an ethical perspective, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster. Because it's a, uh, the place where, from an ethical perspective, it's the place where the traditional consequentialist, uh, neoliberal consequentialist approach, cost benefit analysis, becomes completely non ethical in, in this case. So there are moral dilemma. Evaluation is it possible to uh, to still use the notion of ecosystem service for soil regeneration uh, without commodification of nature. Uh, soils are ecosystems, service certainly, but should we do deal with that as private goods or other commons? There is today a uh, a movement to uh, to consider soils as ecosystem service, okay, but as commons. They are commons by because the ser most of the service that they are performing are public services. They are public good services like re regulating climate, providing food. For, uh, the, for humanities and, and things like that. So, uh, the, the, uh, hence the idea of ecological solidarity, uh, uh, which is one of the slogans today. It's that the idea is that we should share costs and benefits of a better management of soils. So, to wrap up, to wrap up, I would say that we have moved from a plant-centered uh, <coughs> agronomy to a soil-centered agroecology over the past 50 years. Uh, soil is now viewed as a dynamic milieu. Uh, the, and the, this milieu is the result of a long history. And this history is a hybrid history, I would say. It's uh, uh, the history, uh, natural history, but it's also our human history you know, of the uh, Green Revolution. So soil is a hybrid natural and socially constructed resources. And it has to be addressed like that. And there is a huge tension between two ethical approaches. Soil is today managed uh, the management of soil today is the mirror of the dominant neoliberal system. But soil is also, maybe, the potential for a more solidaire or collective action. And second wrap-up, uh, the uh, ecosystem approach is also today, uh, I would say, torn between two kinds of approaches, according to who used this term. And this tension is not resolved. This tension is really here. It's the tension between a, a kind of care ethics based on eco-centric approach and a utilitarian instrumentalist ethics. And uh, that's all. And I thank you for your attention. Shall we take our uh, semi-standard uh, quick five-minute break, give people a chance to formulate questions and come back?
yes, happy to uh, take any questions. Yes, I have lots of questions. <laughs> Uh, so uh, a few things surprised me, so two things. First, I, because you talked about soil health and so on, uh, I thought there was a lot of, and, and of course we knew there are a lot of similarities with uh, this idea of service and function and, what, and all the theories we have in philosophy of medicine about what health, what is disease, and sounds like you, you, philosophy of medicine will have a lot of interesting tools for this case, uh, like you know, social model of disease or health, or the capabilities approach that focus on what what you you are capable of and what makes you healthy, and so on. And then the second point, uh, which is, uh, I think, um, this whole soil uh, question could also be framed as a public health. Question, because you mentioned, you mentioned soil is a public good, but it could also be a public health good. I mean, yes. And with a public health approach, you have an anthropocentric approach. You even have an utilitarian approach, but you don't have this, uh, you know, economic uh, market-based approach, approach necessarily, uh, necessarily. So I don't really agree at the end with the uh, dilemma between two ethical approaches. It's more about between ethics, maybe public health, and no market. So I don't. Know. So two questions. Yeah, the the notion of health <coughs> uh, applied to soil is uh, is in fact only one aspect on uh, on the the how could I say that of the, the broad view of health, I would say the healthization of everything today. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's a, especially soil are one aspect of the big project today of which is called One Health, okay? which means uh, human health, um, <coughs> environment, uh, Health and the what is the, the sort of, uh, and the animal health. So it's it's uh, everything uh, healthy should be healthy today. That this is something that I would really like to work on. Why this is it so fashionable? Why uh, is the this uh, health has completely changed the view of? Uh, disease, and is is really changing the view of disease. And uh, I, in my view, it's a it's a broader issue. It's not just for soil. I'm saying. So I'm now I'm trying to follow the program One Health uh, to see what the how they are working. And one as interesting aspect is that this One Health um, program includes a lot of a research on exposure, exposure to danger, which is quite new. So it's creating new fields of research, new research fields. I mean, at least for from a heuristic point of view, it's extremely heuristic. But uh, from an ethical point of view, <laughs> it's uh, anyway. It's uh, it's a good question because I don't know. And the second question was. So you didn't mention <coughs> public health, and, yeah. and you seem very critical about, I don't know, somewhat critical about uh, the interest anthropocentric view of soil. But if you have this public health framework, it is anthropocentric, but I don't see the harm. Yeah, it is, uh, it is both, sure, if you have this public health view. And maybe it's a way to really find a compromise and, and develop a, a perspective of solidarity, as they call it. Because the, the, commons, the commons approach raises many, many low issues. <coughs> because uh, soil 
is is a uh, is a property. It's not a common today in your, in in most countries in Europe. <coughs> and to transform soil, especially, and we know the the price of land uh, in urban uh, areas. So it's a real problem, and maybe the 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 public health parameter could help develop a more so, uh, solidar uh, approach to that. Yeah, because, so you, sorry when I gave you guys last question. Um, because you were critical of the functionalist or what you call uh, scientific technology approach. Techno-scientific approach. Yeah. Well, because usually in, in medicine, some people like to think <coughs> of the biomedicalization biomedic of health and and I feel like public health usually is the answer to that worries. So maybe it could help. Also. Yeah, it could. Good afternoon. Oh yeah, thank you for the talk. I find it very interesting. I have three questions. Uh, very related. Very related. I mean, the first is about epistemic. You 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 talked a lot about that. I, I, and it seems that there was a switch from. Uh, quality soil to epistemic service, but it, it remains a kind of functional approach, what I would call uh, engineering rationality. And so I wonder if there is other kind of rationality, like the romantic one, you know the farmer loves the, the soil, and he looks at it every day, and afterward he cares about the soil, and it will be like a kind of uh, ethic of care, or something like this. I wonder if, 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 if it does exist. And so it leads to the second question, which is if you have a project to uh, increase the uh, eco ecosystemic uh, service, will you include the farmer? Because it seems to be very uh, top, down. top down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, look, it looked to be about uh, how you, you take policy decision. But I wonder if there is also interrelation between yeah. uh, all the. And, and the, 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 the final answer, the final question, very related, is about permaculture. I wonder if, if permaculture is a kind of answer to the first two questions I asked. Um, what's the position of permaculture inside what you have described, you know, ecosystemic service? Yeah, so the first question, uh, repeat it because... Epistemic, uh, rationality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rationality. Care, care the uh, in fact, in fact the, the, the conflict between this rationality, this is why I try to, to distinguish uh, th the three approaches to the notion of soil as ecosystemic service, but in fact they are not. It's just an I, I, it's analytical dis distinction. But in all cases, they are all together. They are working all together. It's not top down at all. The people from Sirad in France, they work uh, with uh, African farmers and with uh, big companies who want to uh, plant bananas or I don't know what in this, and with uh, the local authorities who want to, uh, to raise money. And, okay. So all these kinds of approach, they are, they are on each case study, they, are, they enter in tension and conflict. So it's not, and especially in Africa, what the, 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 the scientists that we have been working with pointed is that it's uh, uh, in Africa, the farmers, they, um, they work on, their, on their, uh, their land, but it's also the land of their ancestors. And it has a special value, which is absolutely in, incommensurable with the problem of economic development. And they, they, there is no balance. And they have to really make decisions balancing these two heterogeneous uh, values. And so it's really important. They love their land. And soil is int an interesting uh, paradigmatic case study for this kind of what I call universal scalability approach because there is a lot of affects linked to soils. Uh, there is a lot of emotions, you know, uh, coming back to my land, to, uh, uh, and the nostalgia of the land, uh, and things like that. 
including uh, fascist, uh, uh, the fascist uh, fondness for soil, you know. So it's it's uh, it's very interesting. It's a good case study for that because it's really difficult to to use this uh, universal scalability approach, which is developed with the concept of uh, ecosystem. And the second question, I, I forgot it in between. No, I think you answered the two first question because the second was from uh, yeah, scalability. Per uh, I think and permaculture. Permaculture was the same. <laughs> yeah. Will permaculture uh, so uh, it's a response to the problem. It's a response because it's a way to care for soil, of course, and at the same time is a completely artificialization of soil. Not not in the sense of damaging soil, but it's really re-engineering the soil. And, uh, but it's, uh, permaculture is really an example of this move that I uh, identify from plant to soil. You care more for, uh, as much for soil as for the crop which is uh, coming out of it. And uh, permaculture is really important for that. Um, I'm going to let in Max from online who asks, uh, uh, can you explain a little bit more about how the commons approach to soil would work, or works now, or would work if we were to implement it? Yeah, we have tried to 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 find uh, documentation about that. It's not easy. There, yeah, there are some approaches. It's difficult, as I mentioned, because soil is really property, and uh, at least land. But land is soil, you know. It's uh, uh, and uh, and because of all this uh, market, <coughs> so there are, there are many aspects. But uh, from a low point of view, there there is no way to to there in France there there is um, um, an alternative which could be a compromise solution, uh, which is. Um, to have what they, what do they call that? Um, entreprise à mission sociale ou à, à, à multi mission. Uh, 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 entreprise to to register your uh, <coughs> land property or your farm as a company. Uh, with ma multiple uh, functions, ma multiple missions functions, uh, including uh, providing food, uh, providing uh, ecological service, and providing fairness. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a legal status, and uh, it's uh, the guy who is promoting that. He he is a former. Uh, agronome engineer, and uh, he's really trying to promote this kind of turning your your farm into an entreprise like that. But uh, to recreate commons with soil, it's very very difficult. There is a cooperative, of course, system, the co-op system, but it's not really the uh, the ca a common property. It's a common management, but it's not a common property. But just to jump on that, do we have, but we have historical example recent, like Foundation of Israel, a lot of common land, kibbutz, communist country, maybe there's something to... To, to learn, learn from them. To learn. When we not see all of it, but, yeah. <laughs> but of when, it. When Because at least they try a lot of... When you, when you of see land. what has come out, of the of the Kolkos and the kibbutz 50 years after mm. what is left not much but maybe i don't know maybe they learned something at least we or because maybe it's at least in the first step to study them to not to reinvent the wheel yeah. you know? but anyway it's uh, the the person uh, the, the the scholar who has worked best on commons is eliana austin mm. and uh, right. 
and she really tried to 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 uh, suggest a number of solutions. And but uh, for for the soil, it's extremely difficult today. Uh, I'm not just also drunk. I just wonder if the communist model would be interesting or not at all, because it seems to be kind of tokenism approach, like you know. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't imply stakhanovism at all, uh, necessarily. But it's true. That I mean, historically. Uh, historically. Yeah. Okay, yeah okay. No, now we can do it. But I mean, in but the past. but prior to this twentieth uh, century experiments, I would say <laughs> experience, uh, there were there were the, the commons. Mm -hmm. The commons existed in, in Great Britain, <laughs> and yeah, uh, and it. They have been existing for centuries, so it's it's not we are not due to property, <laughs> but it's sure that, uh, in my view, the the legal question is one of the most important today. The le legal response is is really important. Can you yeah. yeah. Thank you for the talk. Also, thank you for speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question about this uh, agroecology discipline, which is very interesting. I think it's this, I mean, a little bit like conservation biology, it's a, it's a crisis discipline, but it's a weird mix of values and science. But it's even more interesting, I think, because there are these, these two sort of opposite values, like providing food and uh, conserving the environment. And I wonder if, um, Studying this, how do, how do scientists deal with this trade-off in these two values? Are there ways of managing inductive risks? Um, and do they deal with this explicitly, or is it more that there is like one set of values that is more dominant? Than I mean, this this double crisis aspect of providing food and conserving the environment. How do the scientists themselves deal with with this? Because these trade-offs must influence their, their research and so on. Yeah, it really influences, and I would s say there are two levels of response. There is the institutional response and the individual response. Uh, institutional response is we assume both missions. It's, it's written, you know. If you look at the chart of uh, the French uh, Agricultural Agency, and I don't know in this country, but I guess it's the same, all European countries at least, uh, they really assume the, that they, their mission is not only to provide food, but is also to protect landscape and environment. And uh, this is official. And officially, they have hired a number of n other disciplines. They have added many disciplines in the, uh, the, uh, their staff. They have a sociology department, they have anthropology departments, they have economy departments. And uh, normally, each program, research program, should include all departments, normally. And at the individual levels, according to their training, they are more sensitive to one aspect or to another. Uh, as I told you, people, uh, warm scientists, they are crazy about worms, and they don't care about humans. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, but, um, I mean, uh, there is always this affect with your research object. But today, among, uh, as far as I uh, follow them, uh, the, the young scientists of INRAE and CIRAD in France are really angry with their uh, institution, organization. They accuse the uh, boss to do greenwashing. And they are uh, protesting today uh, against this kind of uh, greenwashing of INRAE 
and uh, especially Sirad. Because, why? Because uh, INRAE is a, a national agency which uh, uh, receives money from the state. Uh, it's not the case of CIRAD and IRD. There are also national <coughs> agency, but they have to find sponsor to f to to find uh, to fund their research. So they are they have to negotiate. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, uh, formerly they negotiated with chemical company. It was okay, you know, for them. The time of Monsanto, uh, Monsanto was okay. They they received a lot of money, but now. It's much more difficult, and uh, so it's uh, for them. They are they are tempted to to you know to to do compromise, and many many of the young researchers I am working uh, with uh, through the ethics committee, they they are really angry at that. And they say it's not only that we have to revise our practice of research, meaning we don't want to uh, fly. Uh, over Atlantic just for giving a talk or just for a, an annual conference of whatever. But of course, because they work in Africa or they work in Indonesia, they have to fly a lot. You know? And they say, we also want to be, to change our uh, research subjects. And of course, they are doing a lot of participatory research. You know this word, participatory research, meaning that in their research, they involved a lot of local farmers uh, and local authorities. They are obliged. They, they, they have no choice, you know, because they, they, they receive part of their funding can come from the localities. So they are more concerned with the local point of view, the, the, the standpoint of the locals, rather than the, the, the scientific, universal scientific aspect. So I don't know in this country if you have faced also with this scientist rebellion, but uh, in, in, uh, in France it's become, it's very important in Switzerland, in Germany, and uh, it's in France it's, um, it's especially important among uh, in ag agronomy department, the agricultural science. They are the more concerned, most concerned. Hello, questions. Thank you for, for the talk uh, about the agroecology uh, perspective. You. You said that in the ethical question that there were more e ecocentric norms and values, but that could be a lot of stuff. So, so could you elaborate a little bit more on what kind of norms that are guiding? Because a little bit later you said relative to the type of functionality we test for, or we are interested in. Yeah, it's so difficult. So, is it is it a big? Is there one kind that? most of them follow a kind of um, environmental ethics implicitly or is it very diversified? Or? Yeah, I didn't know. It's, it, I just created this analytical categories, mm -hmm. but they, they, they are fictions. Uh, uh, in each case... So, so can you elaborate in, on yeah, that? Yeah, in each case, uh, I would say there is a, a spectrum okay. from the uh, young scientist who is really uh, convinced by uh, ecocentric, the young ecologist who is uh, really ecocentric, up to the decision maker, who is, uh, the bank invest, uh, who is mainly trying to make money out of it. So there is a wide spectrum and uh, I should, instead of making categories, I should have just pointed to this spectrum from the most ecocentric to the most uh, anthropocentric and uh, uh, bank centric, I, sh I should say. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, among the ecocentric values, there are also many nuances, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, among uh, agroecologists. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, working at INRAE, uh, some of them are more concerned with, I would say, 
uh, <coughs> the ecology of uh, of the milieu they are working on, but other ones are more evolutionary biologists, I would say. And evolutionary <coughs> biologists, they are much more sensitive to the problem of the long term. And uh, sometimes <coughs> they really come into conflict. That's why I mentioned the problem of the dynamics of soil. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes there, is, there are conflicts between the short-term restoration of soil and long-term restoration. And for evolutionary biologists, it's really the... Sometimes <coughs> for them it's the medium term they are interested in. So it's, you know, there are all kinds of nuances. I, I should have really show a, a, a spectrum rather than trying to divide up these categories, which doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, there's but it's just maybe just one, one general comment. What, one thing, a reason for why we are also very concerned with soil erosion. It's, it's a time scale because it takes time to form soils. It takes much more time to form soil than it does to, to, to destroy them. It's, it's quick to destroy them. But it, but it takes... It takes time to restore them. Um, and, and the other question or comment or question is about um, what, what is the soil? Because you started by saying we can say soil is uh, first 30 to 50 centimeter in depth, um, but actually it can be much thicker than that, or, or much thinner. And I think for, for many people, soil is not something, they would call it the earth, the ground, but soil is something that may not be so, um, it's a con not a concept, it's something that people are not necessarily familiar with. And I'm just wondering whether we, we are already starting with a problem here and, and I'm sure you know this other notion of the critical zone yeah which it's another way to, to approach uh, soil is the critical zone of the critical zone yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's just if you have any thought about it so. yeah I mean it's really the the center of the, of the, of the critical zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, so on, on this uh, locus, you can see all the problems of the, the critical zone, which is mainly a problem of circulation. Mm -hmm. And what we really need, in my view, but I, I just uh, share the, the view with you, it, it's not, uh, mm -hmm. we need a, a, a real process approach to that. And, uh, and no longer uh, uh, division, you know, dividing zones or dividing categories. We really need to, to uh, look at the circulation of things and of the flux, the flu flow of materials, the flow of energy between them, rather than focusing just on soil. We really need to address the issue of soil in connection to other issues. But of course, we need specialists of soils <laughs> uh, at the same time. But uh, the specialists of soils should keep in mind all the, the cosmic, uh, the Earth's circulation. Sorry, but is it critical as well? <coughs> you, you know the critical Latour. No, it's not la tour, I shouldn't say that. It's, uh, uh, it's a concept elaborated, uh, coined by, um, by geologists, which has been taken up by Bruno Latour uh, to address the issue of, the, of Gaia or the Anthropocene. And the, the, the critical zone is this zone between <coughs> we, uh, of the planet Earth which is uh, which includes the atmosphere, uh, the ocean, the soil, and which is between the stratosphere and the the, uh, the Earth's crust. This is where we live. Okay. So it's the, the 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 habitat 
of all living beings. As long as there, there is life on Earth, <coughs> only on Earth, it's the habitat of all living beings. And this is the concept of critical zone. The idea being that we have to refocus science on this zone, because this is where the future of life on Earth uh, lies. Actually, that's, that's a great, so I want to pick up on something that you were just talking about, because one thing that it occurred to me, and, and I understand why in the context of an ethics committee, this needed, you know, the report needed to look this way. But one thing that I noticed was, was not as present in the talk as I thought it might have been, was exactly this question of, so what are the natural cycles behind all of these processes? How, how would these things regenerate in the absence of any human interaction? Um, and I wonder, was that, was that a part of the analysis as well? Or is this really focused on kind of anthropocentric drivers and human interaction? And so there wasn't as much room for those much longer time scale. This wasn't the target of your analysis to think about those long time scales in which, you know, natural systems regenerate soil and, and, uh, and, and natural systems break down and degrade soil as well, et cetera. Um, um, yeah, how does that play into to your analysis? Because that gets to some of the questions that you were... Yeah, uh, there, uh, there are many people in favor of rewilding, uh, rewilding uh, zones. And this is not really... We didn't encounter this uh, project among the people we have been working with. And I wonder why they, they, they do not they do not trust it. They do not trust rewilding. Uh, why? I don't know. Uh, there are some experiments <coughs> of rewilding, but they are very local. You know, and if you address it in uh, in uh, at the medium or big scale, global scale, it's impossible to rewild. Of course. We have to produce food, and we have to. Uh, this is uh, food security is 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 a uh, remain a vital need, and uh, for this reason, they are not too much concerned with rewilding, and uh, we didn't really encounter this uh, this this uh, uh, cons kind of conservationist. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that I have surprised. I was surprised about the neoliberal term empowering at the end, because the the neoliberal economists from here and each university always complaining that agriculture is the the example of a non-market driven system because it's always states are involved, giving a lot of money to to farmers. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so. It's another problem, but, but maybe neoliberal would not be the right term because it's a market system, but it's the neoliberal, we can accuse them of a okay. lot of stuff, but not of this one because <laughs> agriculture is not free with free capitalism. You are right. You are right. A lot and, of money. And people, uh, and they come yeah, yeah, in it's, it's, oh, Europe money. Oh, Europe money. Uh, a Europe lot money. of Europe money. A lot of Europe money. Uh, you're right. You're so, right. so maybe the contrast is between more Ma market what, what she was saying, public goods and pri private private properties. goods. Yeah, you're right. It's but right. it's the uh, I use the neoliberal term because you're French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Sorry, it was too tempting. <laughs> no, no, no. It's <laughs> no, but, but I use it because. Uh, it, uh, I had in mind that uh, it, it, I, I didn't have in mind neoliberal in the, in the sense of not, no state intervention, but, uh, <coughs> but believing that the market can make it. Okay. Okay? The, the market can regulate. Okay. So it was liberal, but neoliberal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. 
I have maybe a, a, another slightly related point. So, so I just wonder, this is very open-ended, because you mentioned a sort of possibility for this at the end, and I just wonder what, how, what you think the possibility looks like to break, I mean, as, you, as you know, this critique that ecosystem services are just a way to commodify everything. You know, obviously, this is now a fairly standard, uh, fairly standard criticism, and, and we get it, we get it a lot. And I and I understand that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, some people are using it exactly that way. They just want they can put money on everything. Um, but you mentioned the possibility of trying to to intervene right here and kind of drive these two things apart and to find ways to talk about these ecosystem services that aren't just a sort of hidden way to commodify the world. Um, what do you think? What do you think? What is your, or in, in the end, uh, uh, do you think we should, be, we should be going that way or should we be trying to, should we be more eliminativist about the ecosystem service concept? What's your, where do you come down in the end? Yeah, I'm really, it's, it's a real question. It's a question of uh, what impact of this universal scalability mm -hmm. rationality mm -hmm. has and can we can we do without it I, I, and it's it's a real problem which is not conf uh, uh, just for a source mm -hmm. it's a it's a problem for all issues today and uh, it's so powerful I would say I have been working a lot on Lavoisier <coughs> And believe me, I hate this guy. <laughs> but I must confess that his balance, you know, his, uh, his way of accounting everything and making commensurable things that are absolutely non commensurable is very powerful. So, from a scientific perspective, we cannot dispense with that. And, and, uh, and I understand the success of the, why uh, the notion of ecosystem service is so powerful, is so successful. It's, it's a real instrument. You can lever the, leverage the world with that, you know. Uh, but that, that's a problem. It's that you can leverage the world. <laughs> you know? And you can colonize the world too. And uh, it's, it's an instrument of domination. So when it comes to uh, a non-scientific point of view, uh, an ethical point of view, or political point of view, I change my my cap, and I say, well, it's not so, <laughs> it's not so well. Yeah. But I'm really balanced, you know, between the 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 heuristic power of universal scalability and the disaster that it can cause at the same time. It's, it's a real problem. Thanks. Time for one or two. Oh, yes, good. This may be a very like, stupid or naive question. Um, uh, as a complete outsider. But, but um, uh, the discussions on soil uh, seem to mainly have to do with soil as it is found on the ground uh, of Earth. Uh, uh, do the epistemic and ethical issues change um, if you come, if you think of uh, <coughs> soil or something like soil uh, in more artificial environments, uh, like if you want to do agriculture uh, on the roof of, of, of buildings um, or in, ha in housing facilities or under uh, <laughs> under a dome or on Mars. Uh, I mean, I, I can imagine or store uh, soil uh, to, 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 con to conserve it uh, if, if, if nothing else is possible. I don't know. Um, can we, because it seems to, if, if you, if you have, think of these kind of uh, uh, situations that may become more important in the future, um, it seems that it's more like a mobile good rather than something that is there and should be conserved as something that has to stay in this local place yeah. on the property of that flower. <coughs> While if it's a mobile entity, then 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 these 
notion of common sense so on may all become, I don't know whether this is in any sense relative, relevant, uh, but Absolutely, it's, it's relevant. And it's, uh, it's one of, the, of the, the idea that has been developed by uh, landscapers and urbanists. Uh, there are many, many attempts to uh, recreate agriculture within the cities, mm -hmm. especially in, in, in Brussels. Yeah, yeah. And there has been uh, uh, attempts to uh, decontaminate places and many, many uh, attempts to develop uh, green, uh, not just green spaces, but also agriculture uh, within the city and uh, or to also to create uh, artificial uh, soil, but recreate <coughs> agricultural soil on top of buildings, right. or even on the facades <coughs> of buildings. Yeah, right. So uh, the soil is not really rooted on the ground. <laughs> it can be everywhere, and vertical. <coughs> you can have vertical soil uh, for uh, on the facades, and uh, so uh, really, and this is an interesting uh, debate about balancing the, the, the ecosystem service in uh, urban agriculture. Because there are many, many benefits, first to shortcut the, the distribution circuit and to have local production, which is, would change many, many things. And, uh, and also for uh, air depollution. But there are also many, uh, many uh, harms, uh, different, because uh, of housing. It's of, uh, always against the social housing, and it pushes people away from the city center, and things like that. So it's, it's a real balance problem. But you are right. Soil is not necessarily <laughs> rooted. Yeah. Right, it's, it's exactly the same question. I just wonder if you think, <laughs> well, no, but because I, I feel like we, we were waiting for an answer, right? It, can, can, can the soil be mobile? Interestingly, I would say <coughs> not so much, because if you take it from one place to another one, you lose a lot of uh, biodiversity, I guess. So. Is it, is it really feasible? Um, no, it's also because the soil is just uh, in between other. It's dependent uh, on earth, on, on sun. It's dependent on, on, on everything, you know. So you cannot really transport or you change the ecosystem. It's an ecosystem, but it's an ecosystem which is in, within another ecosystem and dependent. So it's really... Uh, of course, you can. It's mobile, but on condition of the good <coughs> environment for it. Right. Right. Yeah. If, if you move it yeah. to a certain point, you will need to supply yeah. new nutrients because you, you don't have this yeah. material, this part of material for which to serve the purpose. Uh, how long will it be? At least three years. It was about three years for you know bacteria and more for yeah. Yeah. Three years. Mm -hmm. You have to wait for three years. It's not an immediate return on investment. <laughs> if, if, I, if I may, if we have time. One more. You have the last question. Yeah. No, please. So, um, we, we, we have looked at soils from the agricultural point of view and saying, okay, we need those soils for uh, food production. Um, but there is now all this idea, all this more than an idea, that, that soils can be used to trap sequesters and carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so now we're seeing soils as an object that we could manipulate uh, through different agricultural practices, or perhaps by adding uh, crushed rocks <coughs> and soils to, uh, to uh, consume, trap uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I'm just, I was just wondering whether or not this <coughs> could be conflict conflicting, um, because it's quite different perspectives. One is, is where you would really uh, 
trying to preserve the source mm -hmm. for uh, its fertility and etc. On the other one, you see the soil as an object that you could manipulate in order to uh, mitigate another huge problem. Yeah, the carbon uh, storage for uh, mitigating uh, the global warming is, is really uh, important, but uh, also soil stores less than oceans. Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, there is more uh, CO2 stored in oceans. And also because it depends what kind of uh, carbon you want to store. Is it organic storage or uh, organic carbon, pardon, or uh, oxidized carbon, CO2? Okay, and uh, we, we are interested in storing CO2. But not, uh, but for. No, we, we, so, so the, the carbon dioxide is taken up by the plants. Yeah. Then the plant decomposes and it turns into organic carbon. Yeah. So the it, it, organic carbon is actually the. In, in, the, in the sun. But uh, carbon is also uh, the, the, the sequestration of CO2, but it's underneath. Yeah, so it's not in the It's soil. not the it's soil. soil. It's underneath. Sequestration is really in the mines or it's under underneath. So it's not competing. Yeah, in that yeah you're right. <laughs> All right. With yeah. that, thanks very much.